Hello everybody, my name is McQueeb and I'm here with a special video for you today. I'm getting a lot of requests both on Twitch and in the YouTube comments for essentially tips for beginners uh, when it comes to Noita, especially now that Noita 1.0 has been released. Uh, I've compiled this list over quite a long period of time and to say that the game's difficult is a bit of an understatement. I'd like to sort of ease you through some of the things that the game doesn't tell you about and to make your progression just that little bit easier. We'll be going over quite a few points today, so uh, get out your pen and paper. I appreciate you being here. Buckle up, this is going to be uh, an interesting one. The first thing that I would like to bring up is the fact that death is a part of every player's journey. Try not to get discouraged by that. I know that's easier said than done, especially if you're prone to frustration, but trust me, in the long run it's going to be worth it. Every single death in this game is a learning experience, whether it's the fault of the player or just some really cheap death that you suffered from. It's, it's one of those games, unfortunately. Like I said before, the game does not hold your hand, and uh, when it comes down to the gameplay mechanics as well, that's definitely true for that. So try to push forward, even though uh, you're going to want to give up every now and again. I didn't secure my first win until around about 150, maybe even 200 runs. And uh, that moment when I did secure that first win, it was something special. Go slow. Explore as much as you can throughout the levels. Get used to the feel of the game. I've seen comments on Reddit refer to running through the level as quickly as possible or skipping biomes entirely in hopes of getting some you know super powered wand down in the lower levels and then you know progressing from there while that's definitely i guess a viable method uh it's not one that i would recommend especially not for newer players you're gonna miss out on on that valuable education early on i usually try to leave the first floor with around about 600 dollars collecting a little bit of cash in the first level may give you the opportunity to either re-roll a perk uh, if you don't see ones that you really like or pick up a wand or a spell um, that stuff early on is super valuable your health should be the biggest indicator on when to leave a level uh, i mean i'm sure that sort of speaks for itself but a lot of people will try to push it a little bit too far i've done this many times myself you might see you know, a, a chest in the corner of the screen or or a wand just off in the distance. Uh, throwing away an entire run just for the sake of that is definitely not worth it. Try to clear downwards first because that will give you a vertical drop in case you need to escape really, really quickly. For example, if you're exploring the fungal caverns on the left side of the second level, uh, it's very easy to get stuck in that area or your health get you know reduced very very quickly once you're in there and if you still have a lot of vertical space to progress through throughout the level uh, after that and you've only got 20 or 50 health remaining you might find yourself in a bad situation you can get overwhelmed very very quickly in this game and that's one of those things, unfortunately. So definitely clear downwards first before you start exploring left and right in each of the levels. Enemies are very likely to sort of come in from behind and, and ambush you, and that can be really, really bad. It happens all the time, even to, uh, even to the best players that I've seen. So be very careful about that. Make sure you check your six and, uh, and cover your butt because they will <laughs> very easily swamp you and uh, overcome you. If possible, and this is going to sound weird, try to no hit the game. Don't don't take damage throughout an entire run. You don't have to be successful. It's it's not even a goal that you need to achieve, but the lessons that you learn, again, going back to those individual interactions with enemies and how they react and, and what happens during those fights is invaluable experience. That kind of leads me into my next point as well. 
try not to take the heart and spell refreshers in the holy mountain if you can leave them behind now people ask me all the time why am i not taking these well a couple of reasons if i if i can right if if i'm low on health obviously take them but if i can avoid it i leave them behind one the additional extra health you get from a health pickup is 10 period it's flat it, there's no like it doesn't scale at all so 10 is a really low number and you may just have to come back later on especially if you're aiming for longer runs so definitely consider that again i know it sounds really weird but outside of the holy mountains there's only a few health ups uh guaranteed actually one only guaranteed i think you can get lucky and find them, but they're, they're extremely rare. And you certainly shouldn't uh, bank on that. Knowing enemies' weaknesses, um, what their strengths are, what their attack patterns are, how they move, is super, super important. Just on an individual encounter level, so you versus a single enemy, it's a really good way to learn what they're capable of uh, and a really good way to, to learn how to quickly dispatch them, if you can. Uh, you may not know this, but there's something called environmental kills in the game, or, or trick kills. So anything that to do with uh, crushing, burning, drowning, um, exploding, anything like that is really, really great for taking out enemies. And uh, one of the great benefits of that is that they'll drop twice the amount of gold. So you may have come into contact with a fire demon in the first level. He's extremely weak to water. Uh, you can sort of set little pools, little traps uh, down with water. He may accidentally jump into them. You can avoid his shots. It's not the easiest thing in the world to do. Uh, but he's one of the more scary enemies on the first floor. And when he's killed regularly, uh, usually by shooting him, um, not only does he have lava for blood, but he'll drop 30 bucks when he's killed normally. Uh, with an environmental kill, if you if you manage to get just the smallest amount of water on him, um, he'll die rather quickly. And he'll drop 60 in that case. $60 early on is, is very valuable. Definitely uh, keep that in mind. Know when to run from fights as well. If you are on the third biome the icy cavern and you see uh, a few hisi keep in mind there's probably a few extra ones coming from behind you might see the hisi captain the larger uh grenade throwing guy uh don't hesitate to sort of back off and approach that really really carefully from a distance uh try to you know draw out one or two at a time this game doesn't really have that style of uh, pull mechanic, like an MMO, for example. But at the same time, dealing with one at a time, if you can, it's going to give you a much, much better chance of success. Let's talk about potions uh, for a little bit. So your starting loadout now is somewhat randomized, and some of the potions that you can start with aren't the most valuable thing. They've kind of tweaked it a little bit recently where uh, there's a few extra ones been added, for example, brine and swamp, uh, and I think mud as well. Uh, all of these can actually apply water to the player. Water is probably your best friend in the entire game and the most valuable potion you can carry. Keep one of those with you at all times. Don't be afraid to empty potions and fill up with water, even if they're kind of valuable, because water is incredibly good to have. Always keep yourself topped up with a little bit of water. You can jump into fire for a few seconds and not take any damage at all. You won't even be set on fire if you're doused with water. And you'll notice on the right side of the screen, the little blue uh, tear icon uh, denoting that. When emptying flasks, make sure you tip sort of the more volatile liquids uh, far away from enemies and in uh, relatively safe spaces. This is super important as well. The last thing you want to do is to start spraying chaotic polymorphium everywhere and turning 
relatively harmless enemies into some late game enemies even if temporarily it's not worth it uh, i've summoned hellworms and beasts from the temple of the art on the first floor and when that happens that is not a good thing you want to get out of there asap while we're on the subject of flasks keep an eye out for a few other ones to pick up and take with you along the way uh, some of the ones that I really like, Invisibilium, it makes you invisible for a small period of time and lets you sort of progress through a level entirely unharmed. Keep in mind, uh, if you shoot, you will immediately become visible and uh, enemies will spot you. It takes five seconds to reacquire that invisibility if that's the case. Other liquids that get applied to the player will wash off Invisibilium, so be very, very careful. Uh, try to stay away from things like uh, fire, acid, water, you name it, any, anything will wash off the Invisibilium. And that's true for any of the liquids that I'm about to talk about. Another really cool one to look out for is called Ambrosia. Ambrosia protects you from all forms of damage. Uh, be very careful though, it can wash off again very quickly, especially if uh, other liquids are applied. But uh, it does give you a pretty fair chance in a lot of different situations. Uh, I'm not going to spoil too much here, but it's one of the ones that I often look for on my longer runs. Polymorphium, while on paper, doesn't sound very good since it only turns enemies into sheep, uh, can be really useful. It does transform them for only a short time, but let's talk about Steve once more, the Holy Mountain Guardian. Uh, if you're able to get him to sort of touch it, and he turns into a sheep, that's a one-shot kill. Sheep have four health, so a spark bolt will take it out in two hits. Berserkium is another really cool one to find. Be extremely careful with it. It does increase your damage two times, as well as your explosion radius. So, yeah, like I said, be very careful. If you're going to be using bombs, I would, well, one, I would recommend not. But uh, just cast bombs far away from you if you can. It's really cool at taking out enemies quicker because you're doing twice the damage. Uh, also, spells that have a very, very tiny explosion, ones you might not even realize. For example, Spark Bolt has a very small explosion. It's almost indistinguishable. That can be used with Berserkium to dig, if necessary, uh, into important areas if you don't have a digging spell. Another really cool one to look out for is Pheromones. Uh, you'll get some really easy heals in the Hisi base with this. It has a few other uses, but that's kind of the primary one. You'll see healers flying around. They're carrying a green gun and they will heal uh, your enemies uh, until you spray a little bit of pheromones on them. They then see you as a friend and will heal you in turn. That's quite good for exploring Hisi base specifically. You'll see them in other levels. I think they appear in the jungle and maybe even further beyond that. But that's the main use of them, yeah. You may have seen a little green tablet uh, in your travels. Or uh, if not, you may have seen some in some YouTube videos, stuff like that. These are really, really cool to have for a couple of reasons. They've got their own secrets within. They do provide a little bit of lore behind the game. You can actually drop them off at the little altar above the mountain right at the beginning of the game. Uh, for a little bit of extra cash. And this can be repeated. If you can find a couple of them, you can take them up there. It's only about a hundred bucks each time. So it's it's not a lot of money, but like I said before, early on, that's really, really important. Be very careful though. If this is repeated too many times, you can summon some pretty evil stuff. Um, I'm just gonna leave it at that. I mean, feel free to experiment at your own peril. The most important thing that I like them for is they're a throwable item and you can get trick kills by throwing them at enemies, which means more money. You can get quite proficient with it. It travels quite nicely and there's a little preview arc uh, before you release uh, the tablet. The easiest thing I found it for is kind of panic situations. So for example, um, you see a couple of pretty tough enemies. Uh, what I tend to do is not only back off, but back off upwards. Uh, if you're flying above an enemy, it's less likely to be able to shoot you. At least the humanoid type enemies, uh, they have difficult time shooting upwards. 
So drop it straight down on them. Not only is this one of the easiest shots to pull off, but you will get uh, you will get those trick kills. The amount of damage it does is pretty high. It's it's actually quite astounding how much damage this can do, especially uh, given a greater distance and uh, the crushing damage that is applied. Uh, it's even useful if you're unlucky enough to have Steve Stavari, the uh, Holy Mountain Guardian, appear. You can throw the tablet at him and hopefully get an easy kill because it does penetrate his shield. Not the easiest thing in the world to pull off and you may need a couple of attempts at that, but it's certainly uh, one of those things that I like to do. Getting a tablet kill from a distance is actually very satisfying as well. Let's talk about a few things the game doesn't inherently tell you. At the start of the game, there's a small tutorial of sorts. It's just background art that tells you what some of the keys do. This is, uh, I mean, while it's helpful, it doesn't really paint the whole picture. Let's start with flying around. First of all, instead of holding your flight button, I use the space bar. Tap the button instead, you'll get more distance on your verticality. This is something that's super, super important. You'll be able to even backtrack into a holy mountain once it's been collapsed. Once you've left the level, you can go back just by uh, getting that right rhythm down. It takes a little bit of practice, but it's super important to learn, I think. If you are going to backtrack into a holy mountain, you're going to also need a digging spell of some description. Uh, so whether that's bombs or energy or something like that. Something that digs through soft material to get through that uh, rubble that's fallen down at the entrance. That'll also allow you to reroll perks if you didn't have enough money or buy wands. Keep in mind, once you backtrack to a holy mountain that's collapsed, you cannot edit your wands in there unless you have Inca with wands everywhere. Let's talk about remapping keys for a moment. So, you probably noticed that F is your kick key. F is really, really important for disarming traps or moving objects from, you know, one place to another. Um, heck, you can even take out frozen enemies really, really quickly with kick. One thing that isn't told to the player is that the F key is actually really difficult to use whilst using A and D as your movement keys. So what I've done is I've remapped kick to the thumb button on my mouse. That really changed the game for me. It makes me a more proficient player and it's one less thing I have to worry about and I can focus on, you know, staying away from danger or, you know, positioning myself when it comes to getting accurate kicks in. Another button that I've remapped is my fifth inventory slot I've bound to Q. You can access that normally by pressing five. That's a little bit clunky for me and the fifth inventory slot is where I keep my water flask. So with Q I can access it super quickly. And that's really important, especially during hitless runs, but if you need to put out fire or, you know, toxic liquid, you don't want to be kind of scrolling through your uh, inventory with the mouse wheel. Instead, just switch straight to the water flask, wash that stuff off, and be on your way. One other thing the game doesn't tell you about is the ability to drink liquids straight from your hot bar. You don't even have to go into the inventory screen for this. All you have to do is use the right mouse button uh, on a flask and it will drink the contents, 10% of it in fact, per click. Be very careful though, uh, you don't want to be drinking lava or oil, it'll make you sick or damage the player. Uh, and if the player reaches 200% satiated, in other words you've, you've drank twice your body weight in liquid, uh, you'll instantly explode and die, so don't do that either. When you're editing wands, the easiest way to move spells from wands to your spell inventory is to double left click them. This is not told to the player and it's a question I get quite a lot when people see me doing it. Yeah, just double click a spell in a wand and it will automatically get teleported up to your inventory slot. Really, really handy to, uh, you know, kind of get those quick editing moments in. While we're on the subject of inventory management, my golden rule is to leave at least a couple of slots available in both your spell inventory and if possible in the wand inventory as well. The reason I say that is as you're progressing through the levels, 
you don't want to miss out on opportunities to pick up free spells or or maybe better ones the worst thing is to have all of your one slots at capacity and you might be using all four of them for different purposes but you're going through a level and you find something either it's a better like host one the body itself uh is capable of a lot more than your current ones and you really want to pick it up or you know there's spells on a one that you find that are super good but that means getting rid of something like black hole or or something equally as important you want to be really really careful about that what i tend to do with my wand inventory is i keep slot number one the first one on the far left for my damage dealing wand my primary wand that i use to kill things with one number two is a utility wand, so that's either uh like a digging wand or a teleport wand, something like that Wand number three is usually reserved for something that digs through dense material uh, that gets me uh, through like steel and uh, extremely dense rock, stuff like that. So it'll probably be a black hole wand if I have my way. Uh, black hole is one of the best spells in the game in case you hadn't noticed. My fourth wand slot, I usually leave blank, except if I have tinker with wands everywhere. Having tinker with wands enables me to switch spells on the fly. So I can use that fourth slot as a storage wand and you're probably going to want to aim for like the largest capacity you can get which at the moment I think is 25 or 26. Definitely important to have during those really really long runs but we're not really covering that sort of thing right now so at least leave one slot free so that if you're progressing through a level you see an amazing wand you can grab it without a moment's hesitation. That's the kind of decision you don't want to have to make so be really really careful with that. You will see other players as well have different methodologies when it comes to how they store their wands and which ones go where. That's completely fine. That's the great thing about Noita is that you can play it any way you choose. Uh, I know a player, Let's Suffer Together, you may have seen him, pretty proficient in the YouTube and Twitch scene. He stores wands in the reverse order than I do, but he's also one of the best controller players that I've ever seen. And that probably plays into why he stores the ones he, the way he does. It looks weird when I look at it, but he's got a system going on and it works. Let's talk about the physics engine of the game really quick. There's a few little quirks that uh, people may not realize. It's possible to actually put varying degrees of strength on throws and kicks uh, just by moving the cursor closer to or further away from the player. That's really, really valuable. You can even do things like uh, drop potions on the ground without them smashing into a million pieces. Um, all you have to do is uh, have the cursor at your feet, standing still, and it sounds counterintuitive, but throw the potion and it will uh, land directly at your feet and you're able to pick it up again. When you're filling up flasks, let's say you wanted to top up your water, for example, and the only water source available is a really, really shallow pool, uh, stand in it and hold out your empty flask if you can. But if you point that flask downwards, you're actually going to collect a little bit more water than if you were holding the flask directly out in front or above you. There's one other interesting quirk of the physics engine I'd like to talk about briefly. And that's that objects spawned inside of terrain appear above that terrain. You've probably noticed enemies dying and uh, the gold that they drop not being anywhere near you. Maybe even like vanishing altogether. It's still there, it's just been transported elsewhere, that's all. And this works on liquids as well. So one really great use for this is, let's say you're fighting a fire demon on the first level. And he's sort of walking around above you. You can sort of... Use your flight tool to jam your head into the ceiling, spray water upwards. That water will appear uh, on the same sort of area where he is and he could die that way. It's, it's amazing. It's kind of annoying when it gets used against you, so be very careful of that too. Some particles do have a tendency to go through the terrain, particularly with like freezing vapor or acid. Just be really careful with that sort of thing because it can take you out relatively quickly, but it's definitely something to keep your eye on. 
There's a couple of areas in the game called the Fungal Caverns, and pre 1.0, it was kind of an amazing source for great ones early on. Uh, it's to the left side of the second biome. Be really, really careful. The enemies in there are extremely dangerous, and uh, it'll be the cause of death for a lot of players, I'm sure. The fact that the ones are better is kind of negated these days purely because the ones that appear normally throughout the levels have been rebalanced now. The level progression of the ones, the strength of them, their stats, becomes sort of increasingly better as you progress, and it kind of makes the fungal caverns less valuable. So it's almost not worth visiting unless you feel, you know, super up to it. You can still get lucky with amazing ones in there, slightly higher tier than what would normally be available. But I would suggest, for especially for newer players, just give it a miss. Uh, it's a cool area to explore. It's kind of creepy. Uh, there's a lot of creepy enemies in there. But yeah, like I said, proceed with caution. Get to know your wands as well. Get to know the attributes, how they work. Uh, get to know the types that spawn in particular locations. For example, on the first floor, there's only about a dozen different wands that can appear. They can have slightly varied stats, but most of them are pretty much the same each time. The only thing that really changes is the spells that you'll find on there. For example, if I find a green wand on the first floor, uh, that's one of my favorite wands. I'd be mad not to pick it up. Uh, the reason I like it so much is because it's got a reasonable mana recharge and uh, it has a really low cast delay. That's the delay between each spell cast on the wand. There's another wand, uh, affectionately referred to as the 10-7, because it has 0.1 second cast delay and 0.07 seconds recharge time. It's one of the most popular wands on the first floor and pretty amazing. You can make some cool stuff with it, despite it being a shuffle wand. Get to know your wands. I'm going to have a wand making sort of beginner's guide put up uh, in the next couple of weeks. Definitely look out for that. I'll link it here in case you're interested. One thing I didn't notice for the longest time, and, and even still I'm, I'm learning about it these days, is that wands are somewhat identifiable before you even get to them, just by looking at them. Uh, so if, for example, you see a, a slight blue uh, haze around the wand, that means that it's got an always cast spell on it. It's not the easiest thing in the world to see, but once you spot it, you kind of get a feel for it. If you see a gemstone in the wand, that means it's a no shuffle wand. So the number of points at the end of the wand refers to the spells per cast attribute. So for example, if you see a single point on a wand, that means that every mouse click, it's only going to cast one spell. If you see a wand with three, it has three spells per cast. It's a pretty cool way to identify that. The longer a wand is generally means that the capacity of the wand is much higher. So if you see a little tiny wand, uh, it's probably got a capacity of two to three. And a lot of this stuff is, is really neat. Like I said, I hadn't picked up on this until just recently. And that's thanks to the great community that we have in Noita. And probably the very last thing that I would like to mention is get to know your perks. Now, I've created uh, tier lists on the perks before. Um, they're, they're kind of popular, but at the same time, a lot of people argue over what is good and what isn't good. Um, that's, again, the great thing about this game is that it can be played in so many different ways and people have very different play styles. Um, some of the ones that I would definitely say to look out for, tinker with ones everywhere lets you edit ones on the fly. Uh, as you're progressing through a level, you might find, as I said before, a new host body that could replace your primary wand or something else. Uh, maybe you'll find a couple of spells on a wand, but the wand itself isn't great. You can take those spells off mid-floor, ditch the wand, and you're good to go. It just makes management so much more easy, and you don't have to worry about, you know, if Steve shows up or you've collapsed a holy mountain and you can't get back. Another series of perks to look out for are the immunities. They make the game a slightly easier overall, whether it's explosion, immunity, fire, uh, melee, toxic, even lightning. All of these are extremely useful. And with all of these 
added to your arsenal, you know, making you a little bit stronger, you can actually improve your offensive capabilities without the fear of killing yourself. Look out for unlimited spells. There's a few spells in the game that have a limited quantity and have to be recharged uh, up until that point. It's one of the strongest perks in the game. It doesn't work with a few things like um, Matter Eater or Black Holes, you know, stuff that really could benefit from that. There's other ways to achieve that. We won't even get into that in this video, but definitely uh, check, check out Unlimited Spells. It's one of my favorite perks. Greater health on heart pickup is something that's really, really useful, especially if taken early on. So if you get that at your first holy mountain and then you find some health ups thrown throughout the level, instead of 25 health each time, uh, you get 50. So it's really great to have. Permanent shield is another really good one to look out for. Uh, it makes you a lot safer throughout your runs. It's not perfect. It has a limited health of its own. Once it's dissipated, it takes time to regenerate, but it saved my butt on more than one occasion. And not just for enemy projectiles that do damage, but stuff like polymorph spell that was cast from a polymorph mage. Like this is the stuff that can kill you instantly. And it's protected me. It saved my entire run just from that one thing. Because remember, polymorph has no immunities. Well, except if you eat a corpse now, apparently that's a thing. Projectile Repulsion Field is another really good one to have. Keep in mind that it's uh, not the easiest thing in the world to use. It does make some of your shots, if they're traveling slower, uh, a lot less accurate. And the last one I'd probably mention is All-Seeing Eye. The ability to see uh, around you and in areas that you haven't yet explored is super, super important. And it also lets you explore a few secret areas as well. And that's it. That's all I have for you today on my beginner's guide. There might be a few things I left out. Definitely throw those down in the comments. YouTube comments are super helpful, both for me and other players, because uh, this community is kind of amazing. And the comments that I get on a day-to-day -day basis are pretty amazing. If you like the video, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't, you know what to do. Give us a sub. I definitely am uh, posting a lot more Noita content these days, so stay tuned for plenty of that. And I would just like to finally thank you all for being here. To check out my stuff is, I mean, it, it means the world to me. Uh, so I thank you for choosing this humble corner of the internet to, uh, to spend some time on. Being a part of the Noita community has been one of the best things for me lately. Like, it's a really welcoming community. Um, if you're on the fence about the game, maybe this will sway you, but like everybody's really, really helpful. All of the content creators I've met, whether it's on Twitch or YouTube, have been amazing people. They've uh, embraced me in their communities and I've seen them do it as well for, for new players and, and old players alike. Definitely check the game out. If you haven't, I highly recommend it. Thank you again, folks. Take care and I will see you in the next video.